If you weren't here last week, uh, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage, but I'm sure you'll be okay. But we're going to kind of pick it up where we left off uh, last week. We found out that all of us have our own love in our hearts. We found out that within, it, within each one of our hearts, my heart is full of Peter love. And I have Peter love that I express to my wife and my grandkids and my mom and my dad. And, uh, and I express people, Peter love to people that I like. And if I don't like you, I don't have any people, Peter love left because I've worn out. I run out of Peter love, right? And uh, so if you don't happen to get in on the first wave of love, I don't have enough love to give you any more. So it's said like this. We, uh, we love whom we want to love until we are called to, the, to, to love those whom we cannot easily or comfortably fit into our hearts. And if we can't fit them into our hearts, then we kind of just set them on the shelf as those whom we, we don't love. And we just kind of hope they go away or make sure that they sit at the other side of the church and bless God. Pray that they don't move next door, right? They're all right on the other side of the city, okay? A.W. Tozer, I memorized this about 35 years ago. It was one of those things I wish I hadn't have memorized, but nevertheless, it's haunted me ever since. It's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly unless he has hurt him deeply. I remember when I first read that, I was probably about 25, maybe 30 years old, and I thought, wow, that's, that's nasty. And I tried not to memorize it, but I only read it once, and, and it stuck in my spirit. I didn't really want it to, but nevertheless, it did. It's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And to, just this la to you last week, God wants us to receive his love into our hearts, He's expecting us to return love, but he's training us to love others. He's training us to release his love to others. Let's say that last line together. He is training us to release his love to others. One more time. He is training us to release his love to others. So today, Lord, give me a revelation that I may receive the shattering from the Lord so that I can love the unlovely. Give me revelation, Lord, that I might receive the shattering of the Lord so that I can love the unlovely. How does God train us to release his love? He does that by shattering our hearts, by breaking our hearts this is repeating from last, uh, from last week. Our hearts are only so big, uh, and we protect our hearts from strangers, vagrants, and unworthy recipients of our love. So people that don't fit our lifestyle, we kind of don't let them in. God wants to shatter the walls of our hearts. So Vi's going to come, and she's going to introduce to us our subject from Scripture by reading these stories. It would be helpful for her to read chapter 37 through to 45. How many would like her to read all of that? Well, only four of you, so you'll have to come back this afternoon at 2 o'clock, and Vi will read all of that to you. For those of us who aren't interested in her reading that much, she's going to read the passages that are on the, on the screen and just give a little bit of explanation as to jumping in between the points. Per adventure, you don't know the story. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived. This is the history of Jacob's family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks with his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day he gave Joseph a special gift, a beautiful robe, but his brothers hated Joseph because of their father's partiality. They couldn't say a kind word to him. 
Then J uh, Jacob sent Joseph uh, out to look for his brothers who had to go to find more pastures. And so we're going to move down to verse 18. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance and made plans to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they exclaimed. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into a deep pit. We can tell our father that a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of all of his dreams. But Reuben came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed his blood? Let's just throw him alive into this pit here. That way he will die without our having to touch him. Reuben was secretly planning to help Joseph escape, and then he would bring him back to his father. So when Joseph arrived, they pulled off his beautiful robe, they threw him into the pit. This pit was normally used to store water, but it was empty at the time. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they noticed a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking spices, balm, and myrrh from Gilead to Egypt. Judah said to the others, what can we gain by killing our brother? That would just give us a guilty conscience. Let's sell Joseph to those Ishmaelite traders. Let's not be responsible for his death. After all, he is our brother. And his brothers agreed. So when the traders came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And the Ishmaelite traders took him along to Egypt. Now this next event is 13 years later, and for the bulk of that time, Joseph has been in prison, falsely accused. So Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Joseph could stand it no longer. Out all of you, he cried out to his attendants. He wanted to be alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and he wept aloud. His sobs could be heard throughout the palace, and the news was quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said, to my he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Come over here, he said. So they came closer. And he again said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But don't be angry with yourselves that you did this to me, for God did it. He sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Those two years of famine will grow to seven, during which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God has sent me here to keep you and your families alive so that you will become a great nation. Yes, it was God who sent me here, not you. And he has made me a counselor to Pharaoh manager of his entire household, and ruler over all Egypt. Thank you, Violet. The story ends with this statement. I've highlighted this in red for you. But don't be angry with yourselves that you did this to me. For God did it. Wow. Wow. He sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. These two years of famine will grow to seven, during which time there will be neither plowing or, sowing, uh, plowing or harvest. God has sent me here to keep your families alive. And so you'll become a great nation. Yes, it was God who sent me here, not you. Wow. For God did it. God has sent me here to keep you and your families alive. Yes, it was God who sent me here, not you. We learned last week that God allows pain, circumstances, people, situations to break your heart or to shatter you. And I, I want us to make sure that we understand something here. This is not fun. Just, it's not 
fun. It's not like, oh boy, honey, guess what happened last week? Yeah, all day long, the Lord shattered my heart. It was such a delightful moment in my life, and I just like to stop and just thank Jesus for all the pain that he has given to me, because I just feel so good when Jesus hurts me. No, this is, this is painful. Uh, it's painful. I don't know if you can see this green. Let me read it for you. Having your heart shattered by the force of the sacred and enveloped by the heart of God makes you a servant of divine love. So let me uh, unpack that a little bit for you. If you want God's love to flow through you, let's talk about me because because I already told you, I ran out of Peter love. My P, I'm a very loving person, you know that, and my heart's full of love, but it's full of Peter love. And the only way for God's love to get into Peter's heart is by God shattering Peter's heart so that when Peter's heart is broken, Peter doesn't have to love with Peter love, Peter will be allowed to love with divine love, supernatural love, right? And so the author says it this way, having your heart shattered by the force of the sacred and enveloped by the heart of God, it makes you a servant of divine love. So something powerful is happening in our story. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, this took 13 years. So when Joseph is about 17 years old, who is 17? Josh is probably pretty close to 17. When uh, uh, Joseph, I was going to call him, jo no, Joseph, Joshua, somebody's 17. When Joseph is 17 years old, he has a dream. And in this dream, he has his brothers bowing down to him. Now that's that's not really all that abnormal because that's what all 17-year-old men want to see happen, right? So there's nothing out of, that's not out of sorts because, come on, guys, let's say, that's a good dream, isn't it? Hallelujah, yeah, like especially when you're 17, like, whoa, whoa. Uh, but he believed that this dream was from God. And so what did he do when he received this dream? You know this part of the story if you've read your Bible. He told his brothers, just in passing, <laughs> When God tells you something, it's good to keep it between you and God for a season, for a number of reasons. Number one, he may not have told you and gives you time not to be, look stupid. <laughs> uh, and secondly, not everybody wants to hear what God is doing in your life. And I promise you, in this story, his brothers didn't. They got cheesed off enough, as you know, as Vi's read for us, they sold him into slavery. And so he's in and out of prison. All kinds of stuff happened to him. And it is 13 years later that his brothers are finally in front of him and they're bowing before him. And if I was Joseph, I would have said something like this. Na, 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 I was right and you were wrong. I would have said something like that. Charles would have, uh, Chris would have, you know, you know, we probably, maybe not quite as bold, but we wouldn't have come up with this line in all likelihood. Brothers, don't worry about it. God did this. And if I'm Reuben and some of the other brothers, I would have said, <laughs> but if you know the rest of the story, they don't really believe that Joseph thinks this. So, if you know the rest of the story, when dad dies, they go to Joseph and they kind of milk the situation, they kind of grease it a little bit to make sure they're not going to get killed now. But Joseph, something was happening in Joseph's heart, and the only way that it could happen was by the false accusations. Number two, this is the second point. If your heart is not shattered, it will become bitter and hard. The first point was this. In order to get the love of God in your heart, 
He wants to shatter your heart. He's going to do that through pain and circumstances, through nasty people and nasty circumstances so that your heart's going to break. And when your heart is broken, then it's ready to receive God's love. Here's the second thing you need to know. If your heart is not shattered, it becomes bitter and it becomes hard. <laughs> oh, the conversations. I have had in my office with people who have become bitter and hardened instead of having their hearts shattered. If God is allowing pain, people, and circumstances in your heart so that we can be filled with God's love, if we refuse to allow the shattering to occur, then our hearts will become hard. So when God pours something on and he wants to break our hearts and we go, back off, Jesus, right? This is my heart. I like it the way it is. And what happens is Jesus starts hammering on our heart and our heart gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. So that when the Lord starts knocking, we can't even hear them because our hearts have become bitter and our hearts have become hardened. In my ministry uh, as a spiritual director, I have a lot of people in my office. I'm seeing a lot of pastors and pastors tell me their stories. And uh, when pastors tell me their stories, I can tell the condition of their heart by what they're going to tell me. I can tell the condition of their heart by what they're going to tell me. And if they're going to tell me something that hurt them almost instantly when I don't hardly even know them, I can tell that their hearts have become bitter and their hearts have become hardened. So every situation that is presented to you has a seed. All right? Every situation... Every situation that's presented to you has a seed. I'll, I'll give you a situation of a seed, of, of an opportunity that was presented to me on Friday. I was in London. I had an appointment in London, and, I, and now I'm driving back. So I, I'd explain this in Sunday school. There's two ways of driving. If you drive in St. Thomas and you have a standard, you need first and second gear. That's it, right? Because you, 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 you never use third gear. In London, you have first and eighth. You just, <laughs> like, so there's a difference, right? So I'm, I'm driving home uh, from London, and I'm, b I'm beside Denny's, and I'm, and I'm coming through that light. And after you've come through the light, it's two ways, and it goes into one. So that's the opportunity to get past every slowpoke that's out there in Jesus' name, <laughs> right? Uh, because you know what? I'm important, and I need to get home. And so uh, there, there's a truck over here, and uh, I can tell this truck's going to go slow, and I'm just about to hammer to get past this truck because I'm important. I've got to get past all these people. And the Lord says, just a minute, I have somebody that you have to let in. And all of a sudden, this person comes over into my lane, And I hear myself say this out loud. Come on, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I can hear myself saying that out loud. And I say to myself, settle down, Peter. I said, no, he could have stayed over there beside, beside the slow truck. And I have this conversation with me for a while. And uh, after, I, after I've done that, we go through, we get to uh, uh, Dingman Drive, if you happen to know where that is. And uh, the slow truck turns on Digman Drive, I said, thank you, Jesus. So there goes the slow truck, but I still have the in front of me. And uh, as I'm watching this person, and it's even a Toyota. Uh, Toyota people should drive fast. That's why they have Toyotas. But I noticed 
as slow as Pokey was in front of me, they caught up to at least 18 more cars. And I said to the Peter I was having the conversation with, I said, see, if you would have cut that person off, cut that person off, you would have been exactly 20 feet in front of you. And that's it. So you need to settle down. And he was right. And so he settled down. But there's a seed of every situation that's presented in your life. And you're going to take that seed, and that seed is going to either make your heart bitter or hard. Every circumstance, every person that you meet, you're going you're gonna to cast a seed, and you're either going to have a good harvest or a bad harvest. A good harvest or a bad harvest. This happened to Peter. Peter. Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? This is John 13. Jesus said, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. And so uh, Peter, this would be Peter number one, <laughs> says, why can't I come now, Lord? He asks. And then Peter number one says these stupid words. He says what? I'm ready to die for you, Jesus. Bless God, I'm ready to die for you. And then Jesus says, not only will you not die for me before the rooster crows, you're actually going to deny three times, not once, three times that you know me. And I know what Peter number one is thinking because I have this conversation with Peter number one. I'm in luck we're in the same name. That's not happening to me. It's not. It's not happening to me. But you know he ended up doing that. That moment the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered that the Lord had said before the rooster crows, uh, tomorrow morning you will deny me three times. And then Peter left the courtyard and uh, wept bitterly. So let me ask you a question. Why did he weep, why did he weep bitterly? Because what was happening? He was, he was allowing his heart to be shattered. He was allowing his heart to be broken. That's why he was, went out and wept bitterly. People, when you're facing situations, you can harden your heart. Number three, there's a lawyer lurking in my heart. There's a lawyer lurking in everybody's heart in this room. And remember this from last week. The lawyer is always asking the question, well, how much love do I have to love? <laughs> Who is my, how, how, how kind do I have to be to that per, How much do I really have to love that person? See, there's a lawyer lurking deep within every one of us. And God wants to shatter us so we stop asking the question, <laughs> well, Lord, who, 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 is my, who, who is my neighbor? We need to stop asking that. God did this to Moses. I'm giving you these examples so you know the scripture is full of this. Uh, God calls Moses, and this is Moses' response. <laughs> Please send somebody else, Jesus. Uh, he'd make a good church person in 2018. All right, 20% um, of the people looking at me, at me do 80% of the work in this church. And you're right on, because that's every church in Canada. So you know what? I see before me, 80% of you are these Moseses. 80% of you say, Lord, send somebody else. <laughs> right? Now, this is really interesting. Because God does this uh, fairly aggressive number on Moses, and then... It's like the, 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 uh, the, uh, the shoes change feet, so to speak. Note Moses, please. Then the Lord said, I've seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so that my anger can blaze against them and destroy them all. And the old Moses would have gone, cha-ching, yeah. <laughs> now we're talking, God. These people are... <laughs> 
yes, Lord, in Jesus' name, slay them. Count them down. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, not to do it. Why? Because by that stage, his heart had been shattered. And at that stage, he was filled with supernatural and divine love. We love whom we love, we want to love, until we're called to love those who we can't easily love or those that we can't fit in our hearts. So God shatters our hearts. He does it by allowing pain, allowing circumstances, situations to break our hearts and shatter us. If my heart is not shattered, it will become bitter and hard. There's a lawyer lurking deep inside of us. If we allow God to shatter our hearts, our hearts will be open to receive the love of God. And the people that God wants to bring into our congregation and the people that God's going to call you and I to minister to will require God's love flowing through us. Lord, give me a revelation that I may receive the shatterings of the Lord. I'd like you to take your bulletin, and, and uh, I need one because I don't have one. Is this bulletin stuff? Yeah. And I'd like you, if you would, to take out the insert that has that picture on it. So there's an insert that has that picture. Lord, give me revelation that I may receive the shattering from the Lord so that I can love the unlovely. Now, my wife doesn't know I'm going to do this, but that's okay. <laughs> My wife never knows what I'm going to say to her in public. Actually, I wrote that down. Honey, I'm going to try and embarrass you less. Well, maybe not, but it's not really working all that well. I'm going to have her come. I'd like you to take this. Let's all stand, please, this prayer. And I'm going to have my wife read this for us. I don't have it up there. You got a paper copy. I'd like you to take that paper copy. I'd like you to put it on your fridge, keep it in your Bible, and I'd like you to read it every once in a while. You see, part of receiving the love of God is allowing God to shatter our hearts. So uh, I'm going to have my wife read this, and uh, then, then I'm going to pray, okay? Thank you. Lord, if I don't accept your blows, how can I love those you call me to love? I've run out of my love. I've expended all the love that I can muster. I've simply run out. But Lord, there is the promise of your love flowing into me. But again, my heart is full. There's no more room. Where can this love reside in my heart that is full? Simple question. Where will your love live in me? It's painful but true in your shatterings. If I allow you to shatter and break my heart, my heart will be enlarged. My heart can then receive God's love, divine love, supernatural love. Lord, I recoil at pain. Lord, I walk away from difficulties and uncomfortable situations. But Lord, these are the very things that you send my way to break me. So I welcome pain. I welcome circumstances of difficulty. Not because I'm a masochist, but because I need your love flowing into my heart and then out of my heart to others. I welcome your yoke. Your yoke is ultimately easy. Your burden is ultimately light. I just need faith to get to that place. Hebrews 12 and 2, let our let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Is this dimension and quality of a love available to me? Yes, this is a gift from you, Lord, through the seasonings of shatterings. Lord, I open my life, my heart, 
and life to your shatterings. Because I want and need God's love filling me and flowing through me. Pour your love through me. Pour your love through me.